Hello everyone, welcome to the July section meeting of the ASUK section. Um, I'm Jamie Angus, I guess some of you will know me. Um, uh, thank you for attending on such a hot day. Um, and we're going to uh, have Leslie as a uh, guest who's going to talk about uh, immersive mixing and um, inclusive within it. I've known Leslie for rather a long time. She's the author of the book Women in Audio uh, and most recently a very basic maths book for people starting in the field. She's got several certifications for things like Dolby Atmos and Dante and uh, practices as a freelance re-recording, mixing, dubbing, sound editing under the Banner Mix Messiah Productions. Um, she used to work in NPR Public Radio when she was in the States, and she's also a voting member of the Recording Academy uh, and its producer and engineer's wing. She's currently a doctor, ca doctoral candidate at the University of Surrey and actually working on a project called Immersive and Inclusive. Um, and I'd like to hand you over without further ado, ado to her to talk about things. When we finish, we're going to stay on this channel though and uh, just open it up as a, a normal conversation rather than trying to jump through hyperspace to a new Zoom link. Um, so take it away, Leslie. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that lovely introduction, Jamie. And uh, you're right, we've known each other for a, a while. Um, really uh, pleased to know Jamie for this long uh, through the Audio Engineering Society. So. Um, you know, it's through the Audio Engineering Society that we're able to network, make connections, find support, and of course, uh, be innovative in our approach. Um, I guess in a minute I should be able to share my screen, so uh, Sue or Jamie, if you want to uh, hand over the, the reins to me, uh, I'll take it. And then of course, I don't know um, from where in the world you're watching, but of course if you're watching in the UK, you know what we're up against here. I'll, uh, fortunately, it is cooling down, but I've turned off my fan so that I, I don't have a lot of background noise. Uh, so yes, thank you to Sue, to Jamie, to the Audio Engineering Society for having me for this talk I call Immersive and Inclusive. So I'll go ahead and start my presentation. And I'm gonna stop my presentation. I think I need to choose the thing here okay and then if i could just get a thumbs up uh to make sure that my presentation is filling the screen uh from jamie or from uh sue yes you're okay ah good thank you okay uh this presentation is called immersive and inclusive access to the best technological practices for immersive audio and of course, my name is Leslie Gassenberg. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Surrey in their Institute of Sound Recording. And there's a web link for my study. It's iosr.surrey.ac.uk forward slash projects forward slash inclusive. And a little bit about me, as Jamie uh, mentioned before, um, I am an audio engineer with an Associate of Science degree from the Indiana University in audio technology. My bachelor's degree is actually in telecommunications. So um, when I went to school a uh, long time ago, there was not, there were not many opportunities to get a four-year degree in audio. So my four-year degree is actually in telecom. Uh, I got my master of science in recording arts from the University of Colorado, Denver, where I taught for about 13 years. I was tenured as an associate professor of recording arts. And during that time, I began work on a book called Women in Audio, which you may have heard of. And as Jamie mentioned, the basic math book, Math Fundamentals for Audio. And this is for um, a lot of times in our, uh, if you're in education and maybe just in the United States, I'm not sure how prevalent it is here, but a lot of students come to audio programs without basic al algebra skills. Or, or any other math skills, and they kind of get there and they think, oh, I'm done with all that math, math stuff. And then they find out, no, if you're going to study audio, you really need to know all that math stuff. So I put together 
kind of a primer that is meant to um, work with audio engineering curricula, and that is Math Fundamentals for Audio. So on to the research questions that I'm trying to tackle. So my background is uh, as an educator, uh, I started getting involved in immersive audio around 2002-2003 and a lovely man by the name of Rich Sanders handed me as I was beginning my uh, education journey as an educator I should say handed me the surround sound course and I had been into you know I'm curious about surround sound since the 90s and I remember in the 90s I bought this high five VCR because I wanted the FM modulated audio, not the, not the stuff that, you know, gets dragged past the dirty tape heads, <laughs> the audio tape heads, but the FM modulated stuff um, was pristine. <laughs> and so I had a Dolby ProLogic receiver. And so that was, like I say, in the 90s, like 1993, I think I went to Circuit City and I bought this receiver. But it was 2002 when the late, great Rich Sanders introduced me to um, the, the practice of teaching this curriculum. So what is it like to teach immersive audio, to teach surround sound? And that's when I first started getting into it. Um, I did audio for planetariums. I did a comparison of three multi-channel uh, codecs for Dolby. And so we studied the high efficiency AAC as well as Dolby Digital Plus at two different bit rates and Dolby Digital. And through that, I um, just got immersed. You're welcome. I got more and more immersed in immersive audio. And uh, I even, you know, through the Audio Engineering Society, which I've celebrated here, um, met Dave Malum. And Dave Malum invited me to univers the University of York to do a... Um, Fulbright, um, uh, to do a Fulbright scholarship, and I uh, got to learn more about ambisonics. So, um, th so this is my background with immersive audio, but as I've been on this immersive audio journey, I haven't seen very many people of color, and I haven't seen very, I've seen women, but not very many women. So my question, my first research question, as I undertake this study at the university at the University of Surrey, is number one: What is the data regarding the participation of underrepresented groups, and I mean women and people of color, um, mostly as seen from a Western perspective, so the United States and UK. Of course, when we talk about underrepresented groups in other areas of the world, those dynamics would change. So I mostly focused on uh, the United States and the UK. Um, my second question is what are the barriers to entry which exist in the field? How might these barriers be reduced or removed? So, um, and excuse me, uh, the fourth question I wanted to get to, which I'm still uh, studying, is to what extent does removing these barriers impact the experiences of underrepresented groups in immersive audio? So um, for the next part of this presentation, I'm going to focus on the first three research questions. And these first three research questions I sort of grouped together in a poster. And I presented this poster at a research day uh, that we had at the University of Surrey. And so that poster, which sort of summarizes my findings for those first three research questions it looks like this. And hopefully um, you, you have an appropriately sized computer monitor so you can see all these uh, facts that I've piled in here. What I found um, when I per perused some of the Facebook groups, some of these uh, spaces where immersive audio is found, this is what I found. So I went to, um, I mean, you guys might have seen me on Facebook. Um, and there's a Dolby Atmos group there. So as of 2021, um, there were about 4,000 members in that group. I think I have that right. Um, but I was only able to see the membership profiles of about a thousand of those people, people. So I literally was just looking at profile pictures and names. Uh, and the reason I did this is, um, because I wanted to see who was in that space, who was participating in that space. And I found only 1% of those participants appeared to be black. 
um, black people, black British, um, black African American. Um, and the reason why I say appear to be is because uh, I don't know who might identify as mixed race. So there's a lot that I missed. And similarly, um, only 2% of members appeared to me to be female in that group. Interestingly, there's an even better study out there about participation in spaces that was carried out by Kat Young and her colleagues at the University of York. And in terms of AES conferences, which is this 8% number uh, next to it, they did a study and they looked at the names of people who were presenting. And this is because the Audio Engineering Society doesn't gather this data. But Kat Young and her colleagues and their colleagues wanted to find out what the numbers were. So they looked at the names of presenters and did a very interesting thing where they used name databases to kind of guess whether um, people were uh, male, female, or um, non-cisgender, or uh, transgender. And if they couldn't figure it out, they actually went another step. And I think this, was, this next step was amazing they actually sent emails and said, could you let us know your preferred pronoun? And uh, they got a very good response. Um, and as part of that, they actually broke down the numbers of participants based on whether they were in spatial audio, de-reverberation, archival, um, or, or the virtual reality, live sound. And so I looked further at that data and found that about 8% of women presenting on spatial audio at eight at AES conferences, so about eight percent were women. Uh, game Sound Con, which is the Game Sound Conference, also gathers statistics in the game audio field, and they found that eight point four percent of game audio professionals in the U.S. are women. But if you look at the far right hand number, sixteen percent of those professionals are in the U.K. So it looks like the U.K. is doing slightly better in terms of if you want to qualify it that way better uh, in terms of uh, people who are working in the game audio space. And uh, then going back, 9% uh, of people working as re-recording mixers in Hollywood, there's 9% of women working in as mixers in Hollywood. And of course, that's where we see Dolby Atmos. That's um, where you would probably be using those tools as opposed to, for example, ADR or um, music supervision or dialogue editing. So um, those numbers aren't great. Um, and um, just trying to sort of drill down a little bit more and find out what the barriers to entry are. Uh, Amandine Pra and her co colleagues at Lethbridge University in Canada did a study about microaggressions in the recording studio. So it's, you know, like I said, Kat Young, Amandine Pra, you know, all of the people getting data out there, thank you very much, you know, I'm applauding you. Uh, Aaron Barra, of course, the Annenberg study, all of these numbers help paint a picture. Um, and and uh, Amandine and her colleagues saw a lot of microaggressions uh, being experienced by underrepresented groups in recording studios and in that space and those spaces. It's also not very affordable. Immersive sound, <laughs> um, if you think of, if you want to say binaural is immersive and you want to make the case that, okay, I can download a plugin and I can, you know, re, uh, re encode information as binaural, then, you know, maybe it's affordable, maybe it's even free. But if you want access to say more than two loudspeakers, it's not cheap. So, uh, and of course in higher education, we have the benefit of having 22.2 loudspeakers or more. And the, the barrier there is, well, first you have to get into the program or in, you know, uh, accepted at the university. The third one, uh, systemic racism unfortunately is a barrier to entry. And I think what we saw around the time I started undertaking this research was a, um, a real call to action by the Association of Motion Picture Sound, AMPS. Uh, um, full disclosure, I'm a council member for AMPS. 
the Audio Engineering Society, full disclosure, at the time, I believe I was either vice president or governor, I think I was governor, um, when we got together, uh, the board of governors, uh, to try and figure out what we should say about it, you know. Um, it was really difficult after uh, George Floyd's murder to even find, even to come up with something to say. But it was being acknowledged. The Recording Academy, uh, BAFTA, which is the British Film and Television Academy, British Academy of Film and Television Arts, and other organizations were all holding themselves accountable and saying, you know, the rallying cry, this won't stand, we understand we have more to do. And there were a number of initiatives that came out as a, as a result of that. And um, again, this is all audio stuff. So I'm not talking, you know, in general terms about the population. This is all in our world, in our audio world. Some of the solutions uh, that we're finding are the solutions that are presenting themselves uh, networking, there's over 70 feminist groups focused on music technology. Actually, none of them are specializing in immersive sound, though, but let's think about who these 70 feminist groups are. They may not refer to themselves as feminist, but researcher Eddie Dobson uh, cataloged them on her website, Feminist Music Collectives, and I'm talking about organizations like Women's Audio Mission, Sound Girls, um, Beats by Girls, Girls Make Beats, Gender Amplified, the Yorkshire Sound Women's Network, 2% Rising, uh, Switch at the at uh, NYU, uh, organizations worldwide um, who are making, uh, making inroads, uh, women who are helping other women get access to these spaces. And there's mentoring, access to training with schools like Dante Certification, the Dolby Atmos Certification, uh, trying to find who will provide this foundational knowledge for these groups. And role models, we need to make visible the leading women and underrepresented professionals who are working in immersive. Now I have an equation here, and that is networking plus mentoring plus role models e equals social capital. So the ability to have a name, to have a reputation, to have somebody say, yes, Leslie knows what she's doing in this space to have, um, you know, to be trusted to use the tools and to be given the opportunity to use the tools. So we need to put those things together. So that's where I come in, maybe. Immersive and inclusive access existing networks to develop an affordable mentoring program in a safe environment, which showcases role models, members who are women and members of other underrepresented groups thus creating a pipeline of skilled underrepresented groups with the necessary social capital to be able to work in immersive audio within the audio industry. I'm not done. <laughs> There's work to be done, so now let's get to this next research question. So we answered the first three as, as, as much as we could to this point. So the next question is, to what extent does removing one or more barriers to entry impact the experiences of underrepresented groups in immersive audio? And that question, to anybody out there who's done a PhD, you know that this is going to get more refined. You know, I, I'm still sort of digging uh, to make sure I'm asking the right question. And as part of that, I'm doing a qualitative study. So with my PhD confirmation report, I am telling a story built on arguments and evidence. So I... You know, what is the argument? Um, maybe the argument is uh, we need to have a safe space. Why do we need a safe space? And et, et cetera. And then the evidence of why this is effective. So that's what, and then do that multiple times to, to build the case, right? And qualitative research is telling a story built on these arguments and evidence using rich descriptive interaction with subjects. So I'm doing interviews with uh, the people who are participating in some of the workshops I'm putting together. What is qualitative research? I f found this book. I didn't find this book. It was recommended to me by a professor back in 2009. John Creswell has a book called Qualitative Inquiry and Research Design. And what John says is, Throughout the slow process of collecting data and analyzing them, I shape the narrative 
a narrative that assumes different forms from, the pro from project to project. I tell a story that unfolds over time, presenting the study and following the traditional approach to scientific research with a problem, a question, method, and findings, as you saw, uh, different questions, four of them. Throughout these different forms, I find it important to talk about my background and experiences. So, of course, I let you know my background and how I got into immersive and how they've shaped my interpretation of the findings and let the voices of participants speak and carry the story through dialogue, etc. So um, there's different aspects to qualitative re research in different frameworks, including grounded theory, action research, and theory of change. So I'm going more with a grounded theory approach. And the goal of this approach is to give scientific credence to qualitative research. And it's illustrated in the next couple of slides with Jack and the Beanstalk. So this is um, just a little way of thinking about how to approach the problem. Oops. Sorry, I seem to have clicked the wrong thing. Beans and beliefs. Do you know the story of Jack and the Beanstalk? Well, Jack goes to market. He has a cow he's supposed to sell for money. He sells the cow for beans. His mother slash grandmother is super angry, throws the beans on the ground, but then this beanstalk comes up. Jack goes up the beanstalk and finds some things. And so that's what we're saying is kind of how grounded th theory works. In order to compose a single piece, the total plot, the trajectory of John's return with better results than those initially pro proposed. In other words, you had to believe that those beans were worth something and then you had to explore to find what there was to find. And then every time you go up the beanstalk, you find something else. I don't know who the giant is in this. Maybe my PhD supervisor is the giant who comes chasing me. Anyway, I think I'll, I'll go ahead and stop there with that analogy. Um, but here was uh, my pilot study which was the introduction to introduction to immersive audio. So I started um, by holding an event for a women's audio mission, and we did it online in September of 2021. And there were 15 participants all listening with headphones. And what, one thing we found as a result of this is everybody would rather be in person. Um, but I'll, I'll show you some more of the outmix, but I was uh, some more of the outcomes, but I actually did use audio movers to deliver a six channel down mix. There was one participant who had six channels um, of loudspeakers that she could listen to. So um, basically that course was, what I taught was this is immersive audio. It can be binaural or it can use multiple loudspeakers. This is how it started in cinema. This, these are the formats today and this is how you can make it. Um, and that was pretty much it. It was just sort of like an overview. <clears throat> but then we got some data. Uh, Women's Audio Mission actually conducted, um, uh, deployed this survey. And so um, one of the questions was, how did you feel about the level of difficulty for this course? That's a pretty Gaussian distribution there. Most people thought it was perfect, and then some, a couple thought it was well, maybe a little too difficult, and some people thought it was too easy. Um, one of the things to get out of this is the need to set expectations before the course. This is what we're going to cover. So that's one way I can build on the research that I've done so far. Um, how many people felt they could confidently explain immersive audio? Um, about seven. Uh, two said no, no not really, and, and a couple, three were maybe unsure. We also had a slide, um, uh, excuse me, a question asking where people were from. And I thought this was interesting. Women's Audio Mission is based in uh, San Francisco, but there were participants from Chicago, New York, Anchorage, Alaska, Washington, DC. So there were, um, they had a very wide, um, n not a, a wide net, but a wide geographical distribution of participants. And this comes into play a little, little bit later. The age of the participants, everybody was over 26 years old. And a few were close to my age, 46 to 55. And then we had one 
um, participant who was older. So I think what we might interpret from this question is that women who are taking extended studies classes at Women's Audio Mission are looking to skill up, are looking to expand their knowledge base. And um, that could be one of the things we take away from that statistic. And then we asked about household income, and I thought this was very interesting because it looked like the majority of participants made over $50,000 a year. And so earlier when we had talked about uh, financial and, and, and expense being a barrier to entry, this might contradict that assumption. So we have uh, some people who seem to be pretty well off. And then if you were to um, analyze that against the um, geographical location, you can see, you know, San Francisco is a really expensive place to live. Chicago, expensive. Washington, D.C., expensive. So these, um, you know, what we might take away again from this, um, from this slide is that these are women who are, have established careers who are looking to skill up and to expand their knowledge. We have a question about the race and ethnicity of the participants, and it's um, just about 50% identify as white, and then the other 50% have um, a, a varying racial identity, such as Asian or Asian American, Black or African American. And again, this is from the United States vantage point. Here in England, we might say Black British, Black Caribbean, Black other. Uh, we have Latinx or Hispanic, and then multiracial, multiethnic, and Middle Eastern. So um, again, if you work in this space, in the immersive audio space, this is probably, speaking personally, this is the most um, diverse group of participants I have seen um, taking classes together. It, with, with Whether it's Women's Audio Mission or not, it's pretty compelling. Have you taken an audio recording class before? Yes, most people have. One person hadn't. And here we see that no one in this group has taken immersive audio before. What does this show us? Um, maybe not much. I, you know, um, I think we would have to follow this up with other questions like, is there any particular reason why you haven't? Or why are you taking this one now? Um, but suffice to say, this was a lot of people's first experience with immersive audio. And then I asked if you've taken uh, either audio recording and immersive audio classes, how many classes have you taken where the majority of students share the same gender or gender identity as you? None is one of the answers. Just the ones I've taken at WAM, none, only at WAM. So. Um, and I, I believe I, I left some answers off of this slide, so uh, my apologies, but uh, suffice to say most people who have taken audio classes before um, were usually the only woman in the class or a person uh, identifying as uh, non-male, non non-cisgender male. If you've taken recording or immersive audio classes, how many have you taken where the majority of the students share the same race or ethnicity as you? And what I was getting at this question was, you know, what is it like to be the only in the class? Or I can sort of get a sense of it, you know, I'm the only black woman in this class. I'm the only woman in this class. I'm the only Asian American in this class. And, you know, how, you know, starting to get at how do you feel in this space? Is there a sense of belonging or, or maybe not? A lot of the literature um, shows us that um, recording classes are gendered. There's a study by Georgina Bourne that was done in the UK that talks about the gendering of the recording spaces. So a lot of times, I think it's safe to say it's a lot of times, women do not feel like the space is theirs, that they, they belong. It's a, it's a good study. I recommend the Georgina Bourne uh, study. And then I, I get away from some of the um, more uh, demographic questions and start asking uh, questions about access. So do you have access to loudspeakers at home or in the classroom and, and what configuration? Sure. So uh, one person said, I don't have any loudspeakers at home, which is very interesting, I think. 
most people, 10 people, said uh, left and right uh, uh, loudspeakers. Three people have at least two front speakers and two rear speakers. One of the people, I think this is also very interesting, has height speakers. And uh, most people also have headphones. So that gives us a little picture about how people are consuming, about how the women in this, in this study are consuming there and listening to immersive audio. Do you have plans to buy an immersive setup? No. And so there's another opportunity for a follow-up question, which would be, why not? <laughs> Is it, do you think it's too expensive, etc.? But we do have three people who do plan to buy an immersive setup. So what we see here is there is interest out there. Perhaps what we can take away from this slide is that lack of interest really isn't the issue. Um, but like I said, this study is ongoing and I would love to know uh, more about, about this. So um, next in the pilot study, I asked about barriers of um, barriers to entry. Have you faced any barriers to entry? And so this is this question is in the study to kind of validate the findings from research questions one, two, and three. And the answer is yes, social pressure. Like what would you know about tech or computers or composition? Before Women's Audio Mission, yes. Like the cost of training programs and the lack of other resources and community. Cost for immersive is a barrier for entry and getting that set up for mastering is a huge investment. And then another respondent put age discrimination. And age discrimination is one of the things that did not make it onto the poster. Um, and so it's, you know, again, good to have this additional, you know, all these additional facts that paint a picture about participation in immersive audio by women and underrepresented groups. And so the uh, considerations from the pilot study, things that I'm uh, considering and things that are weaving themselves into my little beanstalk, the method of delivery, should it be online or in person, the importance of the pilot study and how it impacts future studies, um, why, like I said, why aren't people investing in immersive? Did they have interest in immersive before they took this class? and uh, going on to uh, hold longer qualitative studies. The need for mixed populations of study. So for example, um, I just did a study with a group called Audio Girl Africa. Um, it was a Pro Tools certification course, but um, it was very interesting to see how a more homogenous group of women um, interact and support each other through uh, audio class. Um, uh, that study was, uh, the pilot study that I did was based in America. Um, I might also want to do a study with underrepresented men and women. So um, just a, a mixed uh, group of people next time because I am considering uh, people of color. Barriers to entry may not be economic. For example, uh, we did see one of age discrimination. I'd like to see how people are interested in becoming certified because as you know, the Dolby Atmos certification is out there as well as the Dante certification and access to existing networks. So uh, earlier I mentioned the, um, the 70 feminist organizations and just being able to, to work with those groups uh, will enable me to keep diving deeper into these, into these questions. And so this, is, this work is definitely going to be going on uh, throughout the fall, throughout the spring. Um, I'm just peeking at my next slide, and so you might see it flash across the screen because it's not, it's kind of the wrong slide. Um, so just pay no attention to the Next slide. So I'm just going to bring that to a close. I think what I wanted to do actually is revisit one of the slides. So as we prepare for the question and answer section um, of this, I will go ahead and um, peek over at the questions and answers and then maybe come back to um, the original research questions. 
Hello everyone. Um, okay, we're going to do something a little bit different um, this time. We're going to keep going on in this session, but uh, we're going to essentially bring you all into the meeting and into the panels so we can have an interactive discussion and um, we don't have that awkward um, quantum tunnel effect that we've had in the previous versions. Um, so I think Sue's probably working on bringing you in. Um, yeah, and if I mean, we'll if take, anybody take a little bit of time, but um, yeah. sorry, as, go ahead, Leslie. Oh yeah, I was just gonna say, as we get ready, you know, I just like to invite anybody who wants to talk to me more or to participate in one of these studies to please get in touch with me. Um, I'll go ahead, or or uh, maybe actually, I'll put my email address in the chat for Jamie, and maybe Jamie can. Um, redeploy it to the group because I'm not necessarily sure how to do that <laughs> and I, I'm doing a lot of multitasking right now so yeah you have an open invitation to please uh, if you want to talk about your experiences with me if you want to participate in the immersive audio workshops that I do uh, please definitely get in touch with me because I'd like to have a lot of people um, participating and I also want to just say there are some familiar faces out there. So hello to those of you who I know I don't want to play favorites, but it's really good to see some familiar faces. Oh, Jamie, you're muted. Um. As you're on, as you come online, you should be able to see the chat. Um, do let me know if you can do that. Um, do we have any questions for Leslie? Um, I think um, it's very interesting. What's interesting to me, Leslie, is essentially your experience in audio mirrors the experience I had in engineering, mm -hmm. um, where the uh, number of underrepresented groups uh, in general is fairly low in the student cohort. We used to have 100 students in uh, York and typically we maybe get 10. Um, uh, we actually thought the music courses would increase our underrepresented groups representation, but I'm not sure if that would be the case now. Very mm. interesting. Slightly uh, no, not what you would expect. Uh, mm. Other people, please do feel free to ask Les. Sorry, I cut myself mm -hmm. off. Question. Hey, Susan, go ahead, please. Hi, sorry, uh, Susan Parker. Um, good to meet you. Um, I thought it was a very interesting talk. There's obviously a huge amount of stuff behind the few slides that you did put up. Um, I work at Imperial College. Can you hear me okay? Because there's yes. some music in the background. I don't yeah, know. you sound great, yeah. Cool. Um, and I work in the Department of Physics at Imperial College London. And we uh, have similar types of discussions about underrepresentation. Um, you know, for example, in the leaky pipeline of uh, academic um, advancement, um, you know, we, we, we are suitably uh, lacking in professors who are not white. And I mean, we have some female professors, but th th there is a huge skew. Um, and um, so yeah, I mean it, it. I'm not convinced. Just at the moment, these things are actually getting better. Mm -hmm. I think with the current stuff that's been going on over the last couple of years in the UK, Brexit has been a a, a, a trip point, mm -hmm. and also where in the US the political stuff is not very um, hopeful just at the moment, but. Um, it, it, I absolutely agree. It's a huge problem, and, and we're, we're we're losing a lot of 
Uh, diversity is meant to bring a better 360 type uh, views around whatever problem you're looking at, whether it's recording audio or, you know, study, studying um, high energy plasmas, whatever. So, yeah. And finally, I'd say you said about affordability, but I noticed none of your short questions asked whether people actually built their own systems. But then ah. again, you know, I build my own audio systems. I don't build Blu-ray players. I, I, I would, I would admit, but um, you know, uh, but uh, I have built, a, designed, and built my own phono cartridge. So, wow, that's amazing! Thank you. Yeah. Brilliant. Okay, Kirsten, I think you wanted to come in. Would that be true, or? Hope you're not coming through for oh, some reason. Oh yeah, I can't hear you. Sorry, it's still not working. For some reason, your computer's refusing to uh, bring the vocals through. Um... Oh, I couldn't hear you snapping. Yeah. Okay. So maybe yeah. now. Yeah. <laughs> yes. All right. That's better. It always helps if sometimes if you turn the focus right on. Um, anyway, <laughs> uh, one, I wanted to say thank you very much for doing this. Um, I'm relatively new to the AES uh, mm -hmm. thing. I've been meaning to join it for over a decade. Uh, and I've been live sound for 20 years and oh. I have my bachelor's in audio production from Full Sail university oh. in florida mm -hmm. and i'm currently working on my mfa in sound design for visual media at the academy of art university oh. um and the inclusion and immersive stuff is all i'm so interested in but even like i'm finding master's programs don't offer a lot of immersive mm. courses um so i'm having to look elsewhere and affordability things like that you know i can't get federal financial aid for mm -hmm. a lot of things um but i'm just slowly trying to trying trying to join things that are going to teach me things that i want to know and how to do um i've never had a female professor well wow. <laughs> um I had to think about that for half, all of a half a second. I've never had one. Yeah. I've had a lot of very inspiring male professors, which is, I think, why I'm still in it. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> I love what I do, but mm -hmm. I, I definitely feel alone in academia a lot. So it's good to be here. And I wanted to thank you for that. And I have oh, your email yeah. and I would love to like, take part in some of your surveys and stuff. Oh, like yes, that. please, please, please send me an email because I, I, yeah, there's, um, yeah, I hear that a lot. And I would definitely <laughs> love to talk to you more about your perspectives. It's great. Thank you so much. Definitely. And again, thank you for doing this. Very much appreciate it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, Jay's got a, a question. Uh, take it away, Jay, please. Thank you, Leslie. Hello. Hi, Jay. All right. <laughs> we, we go back a little ways, too. Yeah. Um, and I, for, for Kirsten and Susan, I, I have to say I'm, I'm kind of feeling a little unique in that I grew up in Southern California um, where myself is was considered a minority. So I grew up like two miles north of Mexico. And and because it's a military town, of course, we have a lot of influx of various people from all over the world. So, and I guess I kind of kind of got spoiled by that. Um, so I can say that, yeah, I've I've been kind of immersed in all that stuff. And my my experience with I'm trying to use, sorry, that I, I was a wrong choice of words, but. <laughs> um, but my experience kind of changed once I moved out of that California realm. Mm -hmm. I've had female professors. I've had some great female professors. 
Uh, I'm currently in the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. And to, we don't have a technical program yet, although we are on it. Uh, in fact, we just hired, her name is, her real name is Maya Shipman, but she goes by Susie Analog. Um, oh, yeah. She's, wow. yeah. She's going to be our, our rap lab and beat making lab uh, person. Wow. Um, we have uh, we have changed our curriculum. We've had this whole curriculum reform within the music department. So it's kind of diversifying and getting away from the Western European 17th century uh, centric focus of harmonics and getting into more of the, the world um, spheric, you know. Uh, um, yeah, kind of eye-opening. We have a, a gamelan orchestra. We've got choranga groups and all sorts of kind of fun stuff. So there's, uh, I would say there's quite a bit of dis diversification. In fact, we have an African-American female opera singer who sings with the New York Met on our staff. Um, Janice, is it Janice Chandler? Uh, Latoya Lane oh, okay. is her name. In fact, I just recorded her last summer uh, she's doing a, a whole CD project of uh, Southern Spirituals, which hopefully we'll get to share within the next year. <laughs> um, but getting to the immersive stuff, I would say that, yeah, the, the, um, the technology, at least on an educational level, even to be able to uh, offer a program requires a significant investment. Mm -hmm. Right, especially if you're going to talk about Dolby Atmos certification, uh, especially like doing a, a, a mastering rig setup. Yeah. That's I think that's kind of prohibitive in our realm. Mm -hmm. um, I have a, a master's now from Appalachian State University in educational media, oh. with the focus on new media, which includes includes immersive audio. In fact, my final, my capstone project was an immersive recording mm -hmm. of musicians performing uh, 19th century female um, and um, persons of color uh, composers. Wow. So underrepresented uh, composers. Um, wow. So that was kind of a neat project to kind of get immersed in. Yes. <laughs> and immersive. Um, now, having said that, um, there are, are some free and creative ways to kind of at least get a foot in the door. So um, kind of I, I kind of had to learn as I, I went and uh, creating some of the ambisonic stuff, but um, I'd be happy to help in any way I can to kind of oh, share yeah. with what we what we've done and what we can do and I'd be happy to, you know obviously we're still learning which is why we're here mm -hmm. uh, and we, we just voted to actually create an AES Carolina section oh cool so the, hopefully that's happening in the next couple of three weeks awesome yeah so um, excellent anyway so, sorry to take up a bunch of time but. oh that's good that's great that's great okay. yeah i'll but i'll definitely want to touch base with you to see like what it, what your free free and creative tools are yeah so i've put leslie's email in the chat all being well you can see it um i'll just do it again just in yeah. case other questions um there must be other questions so some silent people at the bottom i mean i was interested in the use you know when you did your pilot course leslie a lot of so you had actually had one person who had no speakers so mm. they had to have used headphones um and that's an interesting question of mm. you know how we should be enabling people to do that because it people are starting to put motion sensors into those little earbuds and things so mm. the idea of people actually having head tracking available 
as part of their system, a part of what they would normally carry around to listen to their iPhones, it might not be mastering strength, is, uh, is an interesting, you know, would that reduce the barrier to entry? Because uh, mm -hmm. you did the course on headphones. Mm -hmm. Was it the headphones that was the problem or was it doing it online that was the problem? I think that's a in really interesting question. Yeah, that is. Um, I did notice the other day, all right, just apropos of nothing, that my new MacBook Air actually does transoral because I was suddenly aware that just because I was listening to some material that had some hard pan left and right stuff that actually it had set itself up in the perfect equilateral triangle for me oh, um, wow. which uh, my you know my my Mac sort of that size but the sounds were coming you know from outside the Macintosh and there's an interesting technology idea from mm. one you know because quite a lot of people will have these devices they're coming down in price mm. is um can you actually do something reasonable i'm not quite sure how you do virtualization for back sounds that might be a little bit tougher mm. but mm -hmm. you could certainly you know there's a a way of if you like a software solution possibly to entry barriers um mm -hmm. is to use transoral virtualization which gets away from the sort of enclosed loudspeaker thing mm -hmm. um i don't know other people it can't be just me talking <laughs> um, so we have mike um, rupert and patricia and five half i think oh and katarina um have you got any input uh, people because i'd be love to hear it Yeah, I was going to say, if you're more comfortable uh, just sending an email or, or, or asking me questions that way, I'm, I'm happy to or answer. Or drop it into the chat and I can reflect it to people. Um, Susan. Um, you're studying in the UK. I mean, are you physically in the UK or are yeah. you remotely? Yes, I'm in Brighton. Oh, excellent. Yes. Um, I mean, are you, are you here just just for the uh, study course? Um, I mean, you seem to be, excuse the pejorative term, but an international sort of person. Um, and, um, you know, so I was just sort of, you, you've done lots of, quite a lot of stuff and-, um, and Yeah. Um, yeah, so I'm I'm based in Brighton. Um, I live here. We moved here five years ago, so my kids are in school here. I've got my little studio set up, so yeah, this is home. Cool. Yes. And um, Jamie, do we happen to have an equalities officer in our UK section at the moment? No, we don't. Um, See, I, not, I not apologize for that. I, I'm a trades union branch chair at Imperial College for Unite. Um, so uh, I, I kind of had my hat on there for a moment. Um, Leslie did help start the AES's diversity and inclusion. Um, sorry, I've got to get the name right now. It's diversity, equity and inclusion um, committee. I remember that yep. um, 2017, I think. Yep. Um, so. <laughs> I mean, one of the no things screen. that we, 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 we talk about is, um, and I don't think this is privileged information it, it, on the committee, but Jamie can, uh, can shush me if, if, if I'm overstepping the bounds, um, but about how we, we, um, how we engage with membership, how we deliver value, um, and you know, how do we actually get the message out to other groups of people? So there's there's hand waving going on. Am I talking out of turn? Sorry, no, no, no. You're doing fine. You're doing fine. So people are just leaving. So Kirsten has to leave us. So I thought just so okay. Curator, keep keep going, Susan. The I mean, I think. We, we need to have this discussion. Um, yeah, so and go for it. so, I mean, I mean, I'm, as I said, I'm, I have a long-term audio interest. 
Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not actually professionally in the audio profession per se um, for recording or stuff. Um, I have done a bit of session work uh, to support when my mother was recording. She was a very good pianist mm. and had her own record label. Um, so I did assist a little bit on that. I mean, I think the main thing I learned was how difficult it is to mic up a piano to make it sound nice. Um, but anyway, we, you know, we, we have this conversation about membership and I'm having exactly the same conversation at Imperial for our trades union. How do we communicate with our membership effectively? Um, I mean, above and beyond just spamming everybody with random emails which particularly if they're written by me when the temperature is 33 degrees centigrade, uh, as I've been done, as I do, uh, you know, it, it, it doesn't necessarily make a lot of sense. Um, but yeah, so, I mean, I, I just, just think that, you know, as a general background question, um, if anybody on, on this talk, I mean, people are, here because they're, they're interested in the, the wider aspect of our our community um and you know we we, we definitely we, you know we, we want to support our membership grow our membership mm. produce something that's relevant for our membership because you know uh, it, it, it does cost a significant wad I don't know if you understand that term. Uh, water cash, yeah. Water cash, yes. <laughs> you know, um, and and it can be, you know, I mean, there's benefits, Stan. You know, but it it's something that you know we want it to be live and active uh, and engaging with our membership. Uh, not just a not just a newsletter that drops through our email box once a month. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I've I've watched um, some of the things that the DEI committee that have been doing. Um, you know, right now, if you submit a paper, you have to um, read the DEI guidelines in order to get your paper through. If you're submitting a panel, you have to understand you know, where we're trying to be in terms of that. Um, the curation of the New York Convention, I think, has been amazing. Um, I just love seeing... Um, I just love seeing the diversity that's being reflected, um, especially in New York. And then, you know, for the European conferences, we've been making a concerted effort to keep it diverse and to keep it... Um, uh, you know, to sort of take away the um, the f all the old fallback of I couldn't find anybody, I couldn't find a woman, I couldn't find a person of color, mm -hmm. or you know, just systematically getting rid of that excuse by you know enabling people to find you know and to and modeling that kind of behavior by you know having uh, I mean, but there's, there's still work to be done. I'm not saying we're there yet. Mm -hmm. We're not, um, but it's I think it's better. You know, um... I know in Dublin was the first time we tried to insist on at least one person of a you know of a female uh, that yeah. identified as female on each panel, mm -hmm. and most panels managed to do that. Mm -hmm. And I, I'd like to say, for the Hague, that was the first um, session where we managed to fully implement blind reviewing so not only are the reviewers blind but they don't know who wrote the paper mm. and i think certainly looking at what happened and the reviews that came back they were a lot more honest because they weren't affected by any preceding status of the authors if there were some so mm. we, we did get better diversity i think through that more young people coming in um yeah, there. That I also see this question from Mike about uh, yes, more diverse Mike, references. Um, yeah, I, I just um, got um, 
a grant to write for a journal called Representology. Um, they are, they're not peer reviewed on purpose because I think they're trying to, again, represent a more industry focus, but it's, it is a journal. Um, I think I even pushed them to get listed in, in Ulrich's web as peer reviewed, but, uh, yeah, just look for it. It's, uh, I'll type it in the chat. Oh, it won't go to everyone, but I'll just put representology. It will. It should go to everyone, Leslie, because we're all panelists. Oh, I see. Um, okay. So there. Um, and yeah, if you just do a, a search on the web. And then there's um, there's also, like if you're doing STEM stuff, there's W. <laughs> What's the women in tech? Uh. Where's? The women in, in, in science and engineering in the UK. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, maybe yeah, you put uh, that one in there. Um, but there's an, there's NC WIT, that's the other one. National Council of Women in Technology, I think. Um, hmm. There's also... Um, Gosh, I, I have to I have to like go open EndNote right now. <laughs> I don't want to open EndNote right now. <laughs> if you email me, I'll see if I can I can send some more. But there's some just on the tip of my tongue that I'm not remembering. Yeah, I mean it is interesting. Uh, I mean this this issue of representation, and I mm -hmm. understand what you're saying, Mike, um, is and that's part of the problem of the whole pipeline thing, um, because there aren't many women in the field obviously there's proportionally less publications in the field um mm -hmm. but uh, but i think you're right it doesn't stop us from trying to look and it's interesting i don't know if people have noticed we're discovering so many women scientists in the you know last hundred years or so that you know did science and did important science and yet we never really heard about them because they were kind of overshadowed by the masculine dominated science of the time. You know, I think you, you're being too just polite, Jamie. Sorry? Uh, I de overshadowed. No, let's be honest. Stolen. Their work was stolen. stolen yeah. Yes. From okay. Them. Sorry, I was Best. trying to be. Um, uh, I, 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 I'm, I'm, a, I'm a trades union uh, workplace representative branch chair, and I've got to the point now with management is. I mean, I'll be polite, Steph. but it, it, it's, it's, you know, as far as I'm concerned, yes. you know, you, you, you got to be very honest, mm. you know, and this is theft. Mm. There, there's no mm. other way around it. Mm -hmm. so, sorry, uh, Leslie. I'm, I'm, no, no, I'm, no don't I'm, be sorry, it's, Sue. Very good point. I'm, yeah, I'm sorry. Far, it's, I'm far too polite. Um, well, no, but I mean, this right, is the problem is, when you're in. Theft. When you're in surrounded by this wall, mm. you're you're forced to be polite because you, you know you, we're we're there on sufferance, you know, mm. because if if we're not polite, then we get mm. kicked off. I mean that's the fear, that's the anxiety. Yes, you know, guess, and and we're true. not seen as e equal, you know. Mm. I mean, you know, I mean, I'm speaking from a rainbow perspective as well. And, you know, this is, I mean, the, you know, I mean, I mean, the Department of Physics is pretty good at Imperial, all things considered. Um, and I personally had a lot of support from, from the senior management, I had a department's office. Um, but, you know, it, 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 it's, you know, and Whilst I may be rainbow, I, I'm, you know, I am embarrassingly white. Um, and, mm. you know, I'm very aware of even how that differential slices the cake. Mm. Um, and I'm, I'm representing a number of people who are um, from different cultures and backgrounds. And you know, this is as a trade union person for, for people out in other departments, fortunately, uh, and and it it's really appalling what happens. I mean, it's not necessarily leadership's fault per se, but there is just this 
just this whole drill down where it just goes horribly wrong. Mm, yeah. mm. This there. is this is where it's structural and what 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 I was just reading about it. is it the Osborne window where what's considered normal is always biased because what you think is normal is your own experience. So if you're white, mm. um, you mm. have you know you don't see the issues that people of color uh, actually face. Mm. Um, yeah, I can certainly remember having. Don't bother going to. You know, it's it's. It, it is. I mean, um, mm. uh, no, I, I mean, can remember. Yeah, and the, the, the and, yes. you know, I'm, I'm, I'm more aware of it because, having got into equalities, because of, because of being right, uh, eventually accepting the fact that I'm a rainbow person. Um, I'm also dyslexic and whatever neurodiverse, so I've struggled with stuff all my life. Um, but there's a difference between being told that one's thick yes. um, and the other stuff that one gets when one's told. Um, and sorry, I, I'm very aware that this conversation is getting very heavy and outside of audio, and I want to apologise for our silent members. No, um, no I think, um, well, one thing that I, I'm finding is that emotion is part of it, you know. And I had a conversation um, with my supervisor about, I, th I think the remark was something like, such and so, so is the first logical thing you said. And af after I was giving all these accountings of, of how people felt, and I'm like, hang on, <laughs> you know, let's, let's talk about that. Because discrimination is, emo is felt emotionally. And racism is felt emotionally. Erasure is felt emotionally. Um, you know, you know. So there's an emotional component to a, a logical argument, and the logical argument is we'd like to in, increase diversity. How do you do that without talking about the emotions? You know, because I think you know maybe maybe people want to say, oh, here's the problem. We just need to advertise our our field more, and I think that's not necessarily true. You know, and I think a lot of organizations that I see are like, let's go to middle school and let's go to elementary school. And and my response is, no, let's start with me, <laughs> you know, and let's start with the person to whom you denied a job. And let's start with, you know, the, the people who you won't let on the crew because you don't think they're smart enough. These are not children. And I think it's easier to sort of say, oh, let's let's work with you know, minds that we can shape and mold rather than, you know, uh, bitter, jaded, cynical people um, who have had to experience the structural racism. That's emotional. So um, I think we need to go there. And that's why I chose a qualitative and grounded theory so that we can talk to people and, you know, and just say, what is your experience? What do you want to see? Um, and yeah, so, I mean, it's, I don't think emotional discussions are out of place at all. In fact, I would argue that shutting down emotional discussion is a way of shutting down the discussion. Oh, you're getting emotional. Mm. It's, it's a way, you know, that's a kind of a closing the conversation down. So, um, well. HR certainly try, don't like it when I get too emotional. My, my vocabulary reverts to my 60s and 70s school environment. And I can quite, quite well assure you that there was plenty of earthy language uh, in that environment. Um, <clears throat> but um, I mean, the, I mean, we, we must have a passion for audio in some shape or form, and that's an emotion in itself, because if we didn't have that enthusiasm, we would be doing something else. I mean, whatever that might be, I mean, a chef or an accountant or whatever. Um, so some the audio, I mean, the thing I find about audio and music is I'm very much in the belief that music speaks to us in the language of our hindbrain 
I use the word term hindbrain very loosely. A biologist would probably run screaming from the room. But um, it's a language. And, and when we, 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 we're brought up, we're brought up into certain genres of music. You know, uh, 17th century tone, tonal 12 note scales um, in the West. Uh, I was fortunate to be brought up where I was exposed to uh, uh, Middle and Far Eastern music and world music. Um, and so I, I already had a bit of a wider appreciation, but these are still languages and dialects that you, you kind of learn. Uh, I mean, I must admit, you know, like all these things, I find Metallica slightly difficult to, mm -hmm. to cope with because it's just like, but that's just because I'm, I appreciate I'm not, uh, that the, the language is that the language of, of that type of music is on a different phase, plane, orientation, angle, whatever you like to describe it. I'm obviously not actually understanding it. I mean, it's the, the, like the difference between Chinese language and European languages where Chinese is, is much more tonal, as I understand it. In the, so, you know, we don't hear a whole lot of stuff because our ears aren't tuned to it. Um, and I'm rambling again, aren't I? <laughs> it is 32 degrees in here, so I apologize. <laughs> no. I appreciate what you're bringing to the conversation because it is all about, you know, not seeing things through one lens, but um, sort of widening our perspective. Right, yes. Um, thank you very much, Susan. Um, I think, again, what you're saying really is we still have a lot of structural work to overcome. Uh, I did want to ask one more question of you, Leslie. On yeah. your study, which was fascinating, there were nobody below, there was nobody in the younger age group, um, which surprised me. I would have thought maybe one or two, you might have got one or two younger people. Mm. Um, is that because of the way it was presented or? Because I'm I, sure Women's Audio Mission gets mm -hmm. people in in their teens, late teens, upwards, don't they? Yeah, well, they have different programs. I mean, they have the the programs from middle school to high school um, and their extracurricular um, stuff. But this was part of their extended studies course. So ah, it probably okay, okay. would have only been, you know, mm. um, the older students. Um, but yeah, I mean, being able to, to cast a wider net, I would love to have, you know, more university age participants for sure. Mm. Cool. So, um, we've had a, is, is there anyone, any more questions out there or discussions or points? Because I think we may, um, be getting to the the degree where our devices start failing due to temperature. Um, um, so conscious less these fans off. Anything anyone wants to say? Okay, I'm going That's to... 32 degrees here. Mm. It's still going up, isn't it? Well, it's, it's... Anyway, in my room, it's dropping slightly, but... Oh, good. This is a new kind of heat. Yeah, hopefully um, <clears throat> bright and it's getting a little dark. I think it's going to rain down here. Mm. Oh, yeah. Well, that would be that would be a welcome relief, wouldn't it? Um, it but certainly... actually reminds me of arriving in New York City, something I've never forgotten, in 1965, stepping off a ship onto New York July weather, which is, you know, 90, 95 degrees Fahrenheit, 80% relative humidity so the temperature is now higher but i don't think the humidity is quite as strong um but i do remember that was uh like walking into an oven I, yep i've never experienced anything like it <laughs> ever since um so 
I think just remains then for me to thank everyone who's still attending. Thank you for your time and patience. Thank you so much, Leslie, for telling us about your research and uh, we wish you every success in it and look Thank forward you. to seeing some of the results. Um, and all being well, I'll be in touch with you at some point as well. Talk about yes. the new maths book. Yes, <laughs> please do. <laughs> I look anyway, forward to it. Well, thank uh, you, Jamie. Thanks, everyone, for your wonderful questions. And, and again, please reach out to me. Mm -hmm. And um, thank you, Sue, for, um, as ever, manning the uh, backroom tech stuff and keeping it all working. Thank you so much. OK, um, cheerio, everyone, and uh, have, a good, have a good rest of the evening. May it rain upon you. <laughs> Thank you. Cheerio, everyone. Bye. Bye.